saw a werewolf with a Chinese menu in his hand. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily reflect the view of Wolfpack Research or any of its officers. The views and opinions expressed by guests are their own and their appearance on this program does not imply an endorsement of them or any entity they represent. We are not investment advisors. We hold no registrations with the SEC, FINRA, or any other regulatory agency, and none of the opinions expressed on this podcast should be considered investment advice. The listener should assume that we have positions in and stand to benefit from any stock or other security mentioned on this podcast. Do your own research before making investment decisions. Welcome to the Wolf Den. This is Dan David, and I'm here with the pack. We have our producer, Tick, and we have our sound engineer, Carl. God help us all. Today, we have Steve Clapham. Steve is the founder behind the balance sheet. Following a 25-year career as an investment bank analyst, feeling God's calling, I'm sure, doing God's work, Steve decided to put that experience to good use and train the next generation of analysts and sometimes this generation of analysts, private investors and portfolio managers. Steve's experience includes working on the buy side as well, actually doing God's work, for two multi-billion dollar firms. He won awards at the prestigious Star Mine Most Accurate Forecaster Award. Wow, that's a, that's a hell of a title there. That's a big award winner. And is still regarded as one of the top forensic analysts around. Steve, welcome to our show. Well, thank you for having me. I'm really uh, pleased to be here. I'm a bit, I'm slightly embarrassed about the Star Mine Award. You know, this was the, you, you know how the South Side works, right? Yeah. So, no, I, no, I actually don't. I don't think they do either. It doesn't work anymore. But <laughs> in the past, when, when, you know, when people did God's work yeah. in the past, if you were in a big bulge bracket firm, then you automatically got lots of votes. Right. Right. So I used to work for a small firm and I used to have a small club of clients that liked me. I still got rated in number 10, but I was always, you know, number six, number seven. I always reckoned that I was better than the guys that were in, in, in the top rankings. I mean, the best I ever did was like runner up in the II survey. Mm-hmm. But Starmine didn't count on votes. It didn't count on your volume or your market share. What counted was accuracy. And um, I don't know whether they still do it, but at the time it was quite a big deal. And it just showed me, it proved to me that, um, you know, how incompetent that the sell side was, <laughs> that I could be the most accurate analyst because I followed a really, I followed the transport sector and the transport sector is almost impossible to be accurate, right? You know, right. because the, the swings are so violent. Right. So you're, you know, if you're, if you're just on the right side of the trade, you know, you're not trying to get the 150 EPS number. You're just trying to say consensus 140. It's going to be more than that. That was that was good enough, right? Right. So it was funny. Yeah, the transport side's difficult. All the hedging that has to happen, and and that side of the business, uh, for the model that they're in, that's uh, that's definitely doing your work. But I want to talk to you about being a sell side analyst first. I mean, look, I've seen a lot of interviews that you've done. And obviously a well-regarded, well-deserved forensic analyst. And you have done many different podcasts about how do you find, you know, the right short? How do you find the right investment? uh, Things of this nature. People can go look at that on your website. You know, I want to do a little bit more about who you are, what informs you, what brought you to where you are today. So tell us a little bit about yourself. Stephen, like, you know, when you got into this business, when did you, did you fall into it? Did you decide you were going to do it as a young man? Tell us. Oh, it was a complete accident. I mean, you know, I, I've got great admiration for these kids that are coming through now. You know, I, I do quite a bit of work over here with universities and there's lots of kids that are trying to get into the, into the, into the business and they're doing these internships in the summer and they're, they've got a whole program trying to build their CV, and, you know, like super impressive. My, I came into this completely by accident. I went to see somebody to learn about, you know, the stock market and what sort of jobs there were. Simply went to have a cup of coffee with a with a friend of, of a friend, and um, he offered me a job. You know, he looked at my CV, asked me a few questions, and I said, "Oh, well, why don't you come and work for us?" And I, had, I mean. Honestly, I couldn't have spelled PE ratio. I knew nothing. Yeah. I could have written on the back of a matchbook everything I knew about the stock market. Right. I didn't know a bull from a bear. You know, you, 
I, you could not have known less. The only thing I knew was I'd trained as an accountant. How old were you at this point? Um, oh, early 20s. Okay. And, um, you know, I had my accounting qualifications so I could read a balance sheet. And at the time, that was more than 90% of the analysts and could do. Well, that's currently the case. Yeah. Well, I just had an advantage because I knew, I mean, I didn't, didn't know anything about the stock market. I didn't know anything about what made stocks go up. I didn't know anything about analyzing businesses, but I could read a balance sheet and I could work out that, you know, an airport was a better company than an airline. And, you know, well, if you keep it simple, you, you'll get into less trouble. It sounds to me, I mean, I agree with the guy who first interviewed you. Uh, you knew nothing about investing. You knew nothing about the markets. You knew nothing about anything for valuations where that's concerned. And that made you abundantly qualified to be a sell-side analyst. So Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I could and, see. And I did really well at it. You know, I mean, as of soon course as you I did. started, people going, oh, man, that, that guy's really good. Yeah. Yeah. The, the funny thing is my, my very first client meeting was with a guy called David Cumming, who at the time worked for Manufacturers Live. And um, he was an award-winning fund manager at that point. And I, I've, I've stayed friendly. I, I mean, I, I still see David from time to time, bump into him in the street, whatever. He's now, um, he was CIO of the UK part of Standard Life, and now CIO of Aviva, you know, massive insurance company in, in London, in the UK. And... Um, the funny thing is, if you stay, if you hang around long enough, the people that you started with, if they've survived in this industry, they're actually now incredibly senior. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you just hang around, and and eventually you'll rise to the top. That is investment banking, and if you want to have, you know, uh, a great career, nine to nine and a half out of ten stocks that you analyze are a buy. You're all set. Good to go. Even if the market crashes next month, nobody's going to hold you accountable. But that took you into being a sell side analyst. What did you What did you feel about being a sell side analyst? Did you did Did you get the bug right away? Where you're like, oh, this is for me. I really really like this. Well, I, I didn't know what I was doing for the first part of my career. Some people would say I still don't. I mean, <laughs> yeah. But the but the thing thing was. Um, once I, got, once I got the hang of it, the, the, the problem, I don't know if it's changed now. I mean, I think, you know, they, they do have some training programs. I've actually done some training for some of the sell side firms. But in, in my day, you started and you were meant to learn by osmosis. And that was quite tricky because, you know, mm -hmm. most people were, you know, weren't exactly compass in the afternoon because that was the day of the long lunch, you know, the liquid lunch. Yeah, And so you had to get all your learning in in the morning. And it's the bubble that you're in. I mean, like you have to be lucky enough to fall into a bubble of intelligent people to learn by osmosis. I mean, if you fall into that bubble of, you know, just, you know, lazy early drinkers, then your learning by osmosis is not going to be as, as fluid uh, or as good. Well, I learned how to drink. I think that's quite, it's quite an important skill. Right? Good for and you. So, I, I and agree. Particularly, particularly in those days, I learned, skill. I learned that. Although being Scottish, it wasn't. You know, I, I already had. I'd done my apprenticeship. I was quite good at that. But the, <laughs> the, the funny thing was that you very quickly gravitated to really smart clients mm -hmm. because they recognised yeah. that you weren't bullshitting because you weren't just telling the story and yeah. talking about what the short-term stock market opportunity was. So the smart people were quite interested in. They, they didn't need me to tell them about the stock market interpretation of the business. They wanted me to tell them about what was really going on in the balance sheet. And so I made some fantastic clients like David very, very, very early on. And they, you know, they helped me right through, right through my sell side career. And uh, indeed, you know, one of my clients ended up offering me a job to move to the buy side, which is when I actually really learned how to invest. Because obviously, when you're in the sell side, you're you're trying to help people make trades. You're trying to help some people make long-term investments, but you're not really thinking about investing, because your job is to look at that narrow sliver, that sector that you're responsible for, and kind of not worry too much about what else is going on in the stock market. So when I moved to the buy side, 
And I wasn't a sector specialist. I was then just given a global remit to go and find stocks that will go up. I thought, oh, crikey, this is actually quite interesting. You know, so it was a completely a completely eye-opening experience. And after a couple of months doing it, I, I thought, why didn't I do this before? Because the sell side, you spend at least half your time marketing. Even for somebody like me, who wasn't a natural marketer, um, you're forced to call the clients. The clients want to see you. So you spend a lot of time, you know, creating presentations, writing research reports, going to see the clients, going doing presentations, trying to pick up new clients, all of which is time that you can't spend looking at stocks. Right. So, so when I went to the, the hedge fund, I mean, I had to go and see occasional client, but all my time spent doing research. And I was, oh, this is much more fun. Before you go to the buy side, you know, wrapping up the sell side, uh, I notice you... Unlike a lot of sell side analysts I talked to, or buy side for that matter, I'm going to say, you focused on the balance sheet. And I really don't hear people talk about the balance sheet, in my opinion, enough. Why do you think it's so important? Well, I mean, on the sell side, you're always looking for a, a USP, aren't you? So, you know, looking at a balance sheet, oh man, he actually understands what's going on. I mean, part of the reason was, you know, when I did the transport sector in particular, some of the companies were really dirty in their accounting. Mm -hmm. And obviously, transport tends to be a very asset intensive sector. It's very capital intensive. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the answers are in the balance sheet. So if you're cheating on revenue recognition or you're cheating in depreciation, the answer is there in the balance sheet and the notes. So that's, what I think, why I, I started to focus on that. Or investment gains. Right, and what we're seeing today, like investment gains and things of this nature. That well, the, 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 what I was going to say is that I don't really understand why anybody wouldn't look at the balance sheet. Right, you know they, I, they I don't mean, though. You know they don't. I just don't really get why somebody would feel that they've done their job without doing that. I know people. I know people do, and I know you know people don't really understand how much information there is contained in the balance sheet, but. Anybody who starts with a balance sheet will realize that there's a huge amount of information in there. And you can, I mean, you can't do your job as an analyst without it. Right. Right. Well, I totally agree. And, and I think that, you know, from, from an analyst perspective, where we've really gotten off track is non-GAAP and how big the, and, and accepted this has become that, okay, there's gap accounting, which is what we should all, you know, crystallize in our mind is factual A to Z. This is a picture of our, a financial picture of our company. And then there's non-gap accounting. Adjusted. Yeah. Or, or the dreaded adjusted metrics word, right? Which is just some made up bullshit by management that means nothing. And it's proliferated our market. Why do you think that is, Stephen? Well, I think the, the, there's a very good reason why the sell side have failed to bring the corporates to account on this. And it's something that I encountered quite early on. I used to have my own definition of earnings. And I kept getting people calling me up and saying, you're, you're, you've got a, a number of 120 and the rest of the street's on 135. What's the difference? And I said, well, I don't know. You know, I don't see what the other people's forecasts are, I, but I'll send you my model. And then they would call me up and say, you're an idiot because you're actually forecasting 130 and you've got a different definition of the earnings. And I said, well, you know, the company, the company's making the numbers up. What do you want me to make the numbers up as well? Right. Yes, they do. Well, the, the thing is that, you know, you've got to, you've got to understand on the sales side, you've got to understand what your client needs. And you're not serving your client's best interests by giving them a number which isn't consistent with the rest of the street. And so the street automatically gravitates the way the company itself presents its numbers so that when the earnings report comes out, they can say, oh, 135, consensus 135, everything's okay. So what I used to do was I used to say, here's the gap number, and this is what I'm forecasting for gap. Here's the real number. So I would take out the, you know, the things that I thought really should be adjusted for. 
like goodwill impairment. Right. Okay. So because it's, you know, it's not a repeatable thing. Sure. Sure. And then I would say, and, and here's the company number. And the difference between my number and the company number was a measure of how much they were cheating. <laughs> right? But, yeah. the, you know, and that was quite, that was quite popular. But when I put the number into Bloomberg, we put the company number in and you can't, you can't help but being sucked into this vortex of this company defined adjusted earnings because otherwise you cause confusion. And I've been saying to institutional investors that what they should do is they should come up with their own definition of adjusted earnings because the accountants are completely clueless and every new standard that comes out creates another layer of complication and obfuscation. And what they should do is say, you know what we're going to do? We're going to say gap is great, but things like goodwill impairment give a misleading impression of what the underlying earnings power is. So let's have an adjusted earnings number that takes a goodwill impairment and a couple of other small things. And then we'll force the analysts to project on that basis. And then the companies will be forced to, to follow suit. But the problem is the institutions are incapable of getting together and disciplining the the corporates. Well, and uh, I don't why I don't know why that is. You don't know why that is. You so I mean, like everybody should know that notionally there's supposed to be what's called no shit a Chinese firewall between the banking side of the business and the analyst side of the business. This. Firewall. You will get burned if you go through it. You're lucky if that firewall is a fern, <laughs> like the thinnest plant between you and the banking side. So, you know, sell side capture has been such a problem in the market now that, you know, they they need and they want that investment banking side of the business. And if you're going to take the tack that you're taking, Stephen, or took, that you're going to say, okay, here's gap. And here's what real adjusted gap would look like for things like, you know, goodwill. Uh, but management's version of gap or, or non-gap, I'm not going to accept their arbitrary version. They're not going to get the banking. And, and that's why. That's why I wasn't working at a big firm, right? Because, you know, big firms didn't want somebody with me, like me with an independent view. And, you know, what? Well, I didn't want to work for those big firms. I, I mean, I was quite looking forward to being employed by JP Morgan, but I only lasted about three seconds. Right. And, um, you know. How, I, how long did you actually last? No, I, I mean, it was a very funny story, actually, because... Um, I, I used to work for Robert Fleming, which is a fine Scottish bank, which had been around for over 100 years. And the family decided to sell out to the Americans. So they sold out to Chase. And in actual fact, it was a very happy relationship because Chase didn't have any equity analysts. And I got on very well with the bankers. And I said to them, you know, I explained to them that I was quite independent. I wouldn't be putting out buy notes on garbage that they pushed me towards. But it was fine because they didn't really have that presence in in Europe. You know, there's an American bank, and they used me to help get leverage with the with the U.S. clients. But so you know, the U.S. transport company coming to Europe, they'd be able to field me to talk to the company, and that was, that worked really well because there's no conflict of interest for me because I wasn't following UPS. So when UPS M and A guy comes over to Europe. We can have a very interesting discussion about what sort of businesses he's looking at, which informs my perspective in the European sector. So that worked really, really well. Unfortunately, Chase then got bought by JP Morgan. And JP Morgan, look at this little pimple on the side of Chase, which is Fleming's, and it's got some investment banking people who are quite good, so that's fine. And what we're going to do with the equity research, because we've got JP Morgan equity research. So unfortunately, I was a lot better analyst than the JP Morgan transport analyst. And I surveyed the JP Morgan top 10 clients and asked us, I said, look, 
there's going to be a, you know, one of us has to go and you might as well have your say in which person you want. And there, one of them was a client I didn't, we didn't speak to, wasn't a client of Fleming's. The other nine, including big clients, you know, like Capital and Fidelity, mm-hmm. they all said they'd rather have me. You know, I was voted number three by the Fidelity analyst. The JP Morgan guy was voted number 23, you know. And um, so this was quite difficult for JP Morgan because the decision, as you can imagine, is a political decision. It's not a decision made based on merit. No. So I, I finally, I, I was told it's okay, you're going to keep your job. And then the day the deal closed, I was at an analyst meeting and I phoned in and there's a bit of silence at the other end, a bit quiet. I thought, that's a bit funny. I came back to the office and I said to my secretary, but that what's going on? She said, oh, they're firing people. They, they, what they do is they call down, they call me and ask if people are at their desk and because they don't want to call up and say, have somebody else pick up the phone so that they know, you know, the person knows they're going to be fired. And then at that moment, her phone went and she picked up the phone and she said, yeah, 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 he's here. And she said, that's you now. <laughs> <laughs> and they bring you down and they're like, um, yeah. We're like not going to need you to show up to work tomorrow or ever again. In fact, you can go home now. Now. Okay. Well, look, that, that worked out for the best. And, and, you know, here we're talking about one of the top three reasons I feel like there's no trust in the market. Uh, corporate governance being number one in my mind, but that's not this show. Uh, y- you went then to the buy side. Uh, and you found that much more rewarding, right? Oh, I, I mean, it was absolutely, I mean, it was obviously more rewarding financially, but it, it, no, I, I mean, mean, I mean like emotionally, intellectually, yeah, intellectually, it was far more satisfying because the first thing you didn't, I didn't have to worry about the clients. Mm-hmm. Now I like dealing with people, you know, I, I, and many of the clients were very, were very nice, but I didn't relish having to, f- you know, fill out a tick sheet with how many phone calls I've made and, you know, that, that, that sort of thing. And the, the, the real eye-opening thing to me was that I could call up any company in the world. I could call up the CEO and say, I'd like to come and see you. And guess what? When you're sitting in, the, in a seat at a big hedge fund, people will say, we'd, we'd love to see you. Sure. Because they assume that you're going to be buying their shares. Mm -hmm. And even if you're going to short their shares, you tell them that you're there because you want to buy them, (laughs) buy them because you want to, you want to understand what the bull case is. And obviously they won't speak to you if they think you're short. I'm I'm aware of that, Stephen. Yeah. I'm aware of that. They will not speak to you. (laughs) They will not speak to you. No. (laughs) the, The interesting, interesting thing was how open the companies were. So when you're in the sales side, there is always a wariness about what you're going to write. There's always a wariness about what they can say. When you're on the buy side, I mean, they're, they're not giving you inside information, but they're giving you information that does really help you formulate your opinion. And they're, they're, they're much more open. I don't, know, I don't know why, because, you know, when I was in South Side, I was quite interested in what the long-term perspective was. But when I would go in, I say, look, we're, we're a hedge fund, but we're very fundamental. If we buy your shares, we will be holding them in three years' time. We might be holding them in five years' time if, if the shares carry on and if the prospects carry on the way we think they are. And then once they've seen you on board and once they've heard the quality of your questions and once they've seen the quality of your understanding, you have a much, much deeper relationship than you could ever have as a, as a sell side analyst well yeah and i know they don't give you inside information but there's a reason people do these meetings in person and consider them better because you know reading the body language especially when when we were really on the buy side back in the uh late 2009 10 11 i mean you could just tell (laughs) the way you ask a question and uh you know you didn't get the inside information but you kind of feel it uh, and I think I think it does happen on the sell side now, quite frankly. I mean, I think a lot of sell side analysts, they know, 
they have the information and their top clients might get it, but the street doesn't get it. And I think we see more and more where, you know, the the top banking customers really get more information than the regular uh, customers. And then here you are, you know, representing a $2 billion fund and you walk in there and say, hey, well, you know, we'll be holding you three years from now, five years from now. I mean, I imagine the CFO tells you everything you want to know within the law and wants to make you happy. Sometimes, I mean, some of them are really um, awkward, really difficult. I mean, I remember buying a U.S. stock. I'm, I, I'm sorry, I'm not allowed to disclose which stock it is because I'm still tied by my non-disclosure um, agreement. But um, we bought this stock. And it went down 20%. And I couldn't figure out why it had gone down 20%. We were a bit early, but you know, we didn't think we were that offside. And so I hadn't met the company when we initiated the position, which was unusual because normally we would always have done so. But there was a particular theme involved here. And this was the best stock to play this theme. And we were quite convinced about the theme. So we thought, well, management, probably not going to screw this up. Anyway, I thought decided that I'd better go and see the management. And so I flew from London to the Midwest of the United States. I spent, I stopped off in New York for a couple of days to go and see the South side to make sure I had all the, had the full story and had understood um, what was going on. And um, the CFO at first didn't want to see me. And I said, well, hang on a second. I own, it was a lot of shares, right? Mm -hmm. It wasn't $100 million of shares, right? And I said, I appreciate you making an hour available in your schedule since I've flown 5,000 miles to see you. <laughs> and um, so, you know, the guy saw me and he wouldn't, he just wouldn't answer my questions properly. What he didn't know was that I'd also had a, a meeting with the chief executive as principal competitor, right. which was a couple of miles down the road. So I went to see the principal competitor. I said, look, I'm, I'm not going to buy your shares because of this, this, and this. What I want you to do is tell me about your competitor, and in 12 months' time, when you've resolved these issues that I've got with your company, I may well switch. And so he told me what was going on. The competitor told me what was going on, because of course he knew the, he knew exactly. And you know, I flew home and resolved that that position was not going to be one that was going to be there forever because I couldn't trust the management. Right. I thought, well, you know, I'm a serious investor i've got a serious position in this business you should be prepared i wasn't answering i wasn't asking questions that were unreasonable but but he had he had something to hide obviously which you found out which is a lesson for anybody listening and it's a savvy move to make even if the competitor wasn't right down the road you find that nearest competitor they're going to want to talk to you especially if you have money to invest with them and and you find out that that cfo had something to hide and and that is where you want to Find an exit. I mean, you want to you want to get some of your twenty percent back, but if you don't get it all back, that's fine as long as you get out. Well, the, the funny thing was, in the same way as the the fall was done, you know, happened sort of for no apparent reason. Um, it then bounced by over fifty percent, so it was just under fifty percent, and the company reported results, and the results weren't that great. And the stock continued to go up. And I remember halfway through the, the, the earnings call, I put my phone down and said, why? It, it was going up during the call. And I said, what, what's happening to the stock? You know, we really should get out of this. And um, I didn't think anything of it. I put the phone down after the call and I looked again at the stock price and the stock price was down 10% on the day, having been up, you know, 6% in the call. I said, what, 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 what's going on? And of course, the dealer had been a bit too enthusiastic about getting the thing up. But, it, you know, sometimes in the United States markets, you get very extreme moves, yeah. which aren't necessarily, you know, you would think it's a very developed market and a very liquid market. And you would think that, you know, prices should move slowly and rationally and there shouldn't be extraneous factors. But in the same way as even, um, in, in you know emerging markets, you see it a lot. And sometimes you just get these odd stocks that have these odd periods. And this was just one of these things that wasn't a rationale behind it. 
the, the share price was behaving quite randomly. And we were, you know, luckily we were able to, to exploit that. And, you know, we got out and I saw the chief executive at a US conference a couple of months later. And I said, I just wanted to say thanks very much because, you know, you and your colleagues really didn't give me any help whatsoever. And I just wanted to tell you that I made X million dollars on your stock. And I've got out, and I'm, I won't be buying it again. You won't be hearing from me or seeing me again, because I don't feel that you were that you were open and, and, and honest with me. So I just wanted to, to to leave that with you. And he, you know, he couldn't have cared less. Huh? <laughs> That's you know, he's I, not I, the chief executive anymore. I love I love the UK people from the UK. I mean, that's so polite. Yeah, <laughs> I'd have been like, listen, fuckhead, <laughs> look what happened. <laughs> I talked to your douche number two. He didn't say anything to me except, you know, hide the results that I found out from a competitor. So I took the first opportunity to dump your shit and I'll be telling everybody to do the same thing. Good seeing you again. Yeah. I mean, that was what I said, but oh, so okay. very, very proper and polite. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> So we, you'd worked for a tiger cub at one of the, I don't know if this is the firm you're talking about now in this example, but you know, I just wanted to make a, a remark in, you know, in working with some of the tiger cubs uh, and looking at their portfolios. Did you ever feel like they had group think? Like, it seems like a great many of them own the same stocks. You know, I worked for Tosca, which was, and, and the, the example wasn't um, Tosca, but um, I worked for Tosca and um, we were in the UK and all the other Tiger Cubs are in America. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I mean, I, I know that there is a bit of sort of camaraderie amongst them. And it may be that, you know, we were a financials fund and I was responsible for the non-financials investment. And so it may well be that there would be conversations about the financials um, that they that they held as a, as a group as they used to work together. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I mean, you know, I didn't really know any of the Tiger Clubs. I mean, I knew um, a couple that we would meet at conferences and, and whatever, but um, it really wasn't a, a case of we're doing this, what are you doing? We were very private and worked our, worked our own path and we were very specialist. Yeah. You're kind of in your own silo. Well, yeah, we, because we, you know, we were just doing banks and insurance companies and a bit of property, right. and then my sort of special situations on the side. Right. So, you know, occasionally we would, you know, I would have a conversation with what, you know, somebody else, um, either from a tag cover from another fund, but we operated a policy that was the only person that was allowed to say anything was the boss. I mean, we were, I was not allowed to speak about our positions to um, other investors, and I wasn't allowed to speak about anything to the press. So all Good my policy. press contacts completely, completely cut off. Was absolutely forbidden to speak to the press. So we were very, we you know, we were very. Let's keep in our own area and not get distracted by what other people were doing. So from here, you've really kind of diverged off into your own. You've decided. Like I've, I've got a method and I want to, and I want to teach, I want to share it with the world. Uh, and you've done that behind the balance sheet. And through that, you, you found a, a lot of fraud, something I have some experience with. Uh, and that is basically tearing apart, you know, the balance sheet, profit and loss statement, doing the fundamental things that we do. And, you know, one of the things you were pointing out, I mean, everybody talks about Alibaba. I've talked about them and, uh, you know, I think you know, the way I've, I've said this is like, you can't prove they're not a fraud. It's not that you're proving they are. You can't prove they're not. I can prove that Amazon's not a fraud. And one of the things that you talk about before is like, I mean, you look at a corporate filing for Amazon, how many pages is it? Like 80, 90? And 90 you, pages, I mean, yeah. Yeah. And, and how many, how many pages of Alibaba? Like 500? The more recent ones are 500. Yeah. In 2017 um, was 1,070, Jeez. which, you know, I just looked at the last filing. I didn't go back and check. You know, when I did the quote for the client, the client asked me to do a report, a forensic accounting report on Alibaba and four of its peers. Well, I didn't 
look at all the filings going back in time. I just looked at the most recent ones to get an idea. And I thought, oh, 500 pages, that's big. <laughs> 1,000 pages, oh, man. I, you know, that was really, it was really painful to, to, to go through. And you still can't do it because you'd have to really pull hundreds, if not, I think it's over a thousand SAIC filings in China for the subsidiaries that they own. 800, I think it was Yeah, for Alibaba. And, but of course, there's also a, a large number of investment. I mean, I, a seriously large number of investment and for which the, you know, there's very little information available. Right, right. Because they consider most of them non-material, even though they're you know millions and millions. But it's that's that's my problem, like in a nutshell with Alibaba. Like I want to be able to eliminate uh, fraud and material misrepresentations as an issue, especially in the in the China market, and and you just can't there, and you can't for a lot of them. How, how long did it take you to get through the the filing and and do your investigation? Um. It was a couple of months work for that project. And there was myself and a colleague full time and another colleague part time. And in that couple of months, could you prove they're not a fraud? No. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> neither, neither can anybody from MIT. So <laughs> and then I look at this Ant Financial IPO and I've been I've been asked to talk about it, you know, several times and, and to be quoted. And the simplest thing I can say is like, I mean, look. <laughs> Here you have Ant Financial in, in the year 2020, but really what were they eight or nine years ago? Basically Alipay, right? They were the financial arm of, of Alibaba. They were Alipay. And who owned Alipay for, for a period of time? But Yahoo. Yahoo owned them. And Jack Ma comes to Yahoo and says, you know what? <laughs> Big mistake. You can't actually own Alipay. So you're going to have to sell it back to me at basically this price, which is, you know, a fraction of what you know, Ant Financial is worth today, because, you know, the China Communist Party says you can't own them. So, you know, you're going to make some profit on this deal, but it's nowhere near long term what Alipay is going to be worth, which is playing out today. So the problem that they had eight years ago is that. You know, Alipay is a financial instrument, a huge financial instrument in China, you know, can't be owned by foreign nationals. So now they're going to make it a public company and who's it going to be owned by, right? So the whole thing is bullshit. They, they should have never done that eight years ago. Yahoo should be pitching a fit today, but if they did, they, you know, they'd hear it back from China. And this is my problem again with Alibaba and these and these shenanigans. I mean, do you see it that way? How um, Jack Ma and the other participants managed to acquire Ant Financial or whatever it was called then? Um, I can't remember. What it, was, it was called was it called Alipay then? Yeah. And and um, how they did that is a matter of <laughs> some mystery. And you know, when you look at that and you look at what you get as a shareholder today and what your rights are is quite bizarre. But, you know, I, I've had this conversation with, in, in the past. And I think, you know, there's one view which says, you know, Alibaba is therefore untouchable and you couldn't possibly own the shares because Jack Ma has misappropriated those assets in the past and he could do it again. I mean, I do think, and, and the whole issue about the, you know, the, Cayman Islands or offshore vehicles and the variable interest entities and all of that. I, I do think that, you know, yes, it's questionable whether you, what you own, right? It's questionable whether the paper, the piece of paper that you own has any real rights associated with it. But I also wonder whether you'll ever get to the situation in which you actually have to contest that. Because if you end up trying to enforce your rights in a Chinese court, well, unlikely you'll be able to enforce them, but it's all equally unlikely that Chinese, these Chinese companies will ever have access to global capital markets again. So I think that, you know, you're, the, the, the reality is that people have invested in these things in the knowledge that they don't have any real rights, 
but also on the assumption that the Chinese government will let them have the access to the rights and won't bring the curtain down. What's quite interesting, I think, is the fact that the Chinese government took this action on Ant Financial so close to the IPO when the bankers had already spent their bonuses mentally and when people were already spending their, their, their winnings in the, in the IPO lottery. And um, they've sent a very clear signal to the world who's in charge. And what I think is really going to be fascinating is if the American authorities do decide that the U.S. authorities should have the right to oversee the audit of the Chinese companies. And this exclusion, which has been there for the last several years, doesn't really make any sense to me, the national security exclusion. So if the Americans do pursue this, then presumably these companies will be forced to retreat back to China. Well, we are pursuing it. It's, it's something I've worked on for 10 years. Uh, so it was, it was nice to see that it, it passed with not just bipartisan support, unanimous in yeah. both the House and the Senate. Nothing happens that way. So whether you know, President Trump likes it or not, or uh, incoming President-elect Biden likes it or not, it's happening, that part of it anyway. I don't think, I think it's a right first step, right? I, and, and it's ridiculous that it's taken, oh, geez, what has it been, nine years since the long top financial fraud where Deloitte was told they could not send the audit paperwork out. And, and, and China has slow walked it this long and we didn't have the political will. Believe me, we didn't. I was in Washington, you know, half a dozen times trying to educate our, our legislators. Uh, not easy. But it still is not stopping our investments to go to Hong Kong. So, you know, when Alibaba does a secondary listing in Hong Kong and you see these other companies that are just like, you know, Ant Financial is going to Hong Kong. Um, for this to really work, we have to stop our pension money. You know, Morgan Stanley, when, you know, their private equity funds, one, two, three, and four, they're very, very, very big vehicles. The MSCI Global Index, the Emerging Market Index, for it to really matter, we have to affect those as well. Uh, so it's going to be interesting to see over the next two and a half years where that needle moves. Does it move toward effective real change in stopping us from investing in these companies, even in foreign markets, and, and pushing MSCI? Or does China push back enough and hurt our political will as they have always done very, very well? And this really has no teeth. And it becomes about an audit only. Because when you're talking about auditors, I mean, Stephen, honestly, how much do they matter? Well, it's an interesting question, isn't it? I mean, you know, the, the, the cost of an audit in China isn't much. But, you know, even in the UK, where the, you know, the cost of an audit is more reasonable and more sensible, the actual implementation of the audit has been disastrous. Um, but there's, the, the audit firms in London are certainly taking this all pretty seriously. And so they should, because they've really been, really been um, hit with some big fines. And the regulator has really started to show that, that it's got some teeth. And in fact, the regulator is making very encouraging noises in, in the UK. So I'm, I take great comfort from that. And I think Wirecard, um, the actions by EY are, are just amuse me. I mean, EY saying, yeah, wasn't it good that we caught this fraud? Sure. You, you sat there denying it for like 18 months after the Financial Times had pointed out that the, that the numbers were, were all wrong. And, you know, it, it's actually only a sort of 10 minute job to, to discover that there is something wrong. So what they were doing in the audit, I've got absolutely no no idea. That's what you had talked about in a in a recent article too. That the auditors weren't going far enough, wasn't it? That they're they're just kind of doing that surface level stamp of approval on whatever numbers the companies are passing to them. Well, I, to be honest, I don't really understand what they're doing. They don't certainly don't seem to be exercising any dispassionate, objective, sensible analysis. 
And um, I I started off, you know, when I, I did the Forensic Accounting course for my first client in the middle of 2018, I got in touch with all the auditors and I said, you know, I, I, I'm a bit concerned about the state of auditing and, you know, can I come around and have a chat with you? Because I've just done this Forensic Accounting course. I spent weeks in the British Library studying past frauds and I've been studying all the current frauds and I don't really understand why you can't work this out. And would you spend some time with me? And um, two of the firms agreed to meet me. One said, we're not really interested in anything you've got to sell. <laughs> I, I, I hadn't tried to sell them anything. And one didn't even bother replying. And um, I, I went around to see one firm in particular, and I pointed out to them that more than 10 years previously, I designed them uh, a tool to help them when they went into the audit at first to identify the key risk areas. And I said, so, you know, what have you done with that tool? And they said, no, no idea. Right. I said, well, you know, what, why can't you just, you know, I've given you the tools that you need. Why don't you just use them? Because they're too effective. Uh, I, I don't know. No, don't know. look, they're too effective and you lose a client. And then somebody else picks up the client. I mean, and that's, and really since Arthur Anderson got the death penalty, which I think people regret now in the, in the corporate world, um, doing away with them, what happened with Wirecard, I think was more egregious than what happened with Enron. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. And Arthur Anderson lost her charter and there's, there's not even a speck of a conversation about EY losing theirs. Oh, well, I, you know, EY, I think, is must be seriously concerned about this. I mean, well, I, they're going to pay a fine. They're going to pay a fine and charge more for audits. I mean, that's what we do here in the United States, right? When Wells Fargo has to pay a fine for a half a billion dollars for defrauding their customers and and their market share takes a hit. So their investors lose because of the fraud they committed. The investors get fucked twice. Because they're the ones paying the five hundred million dollar fine, yes. and nobody goes to jail. So you know, Wells Fargo cannot commit fraud. It's impossible for a company to commit fraud. Wirecard cannot commit fraud. People commit fraud. Yeah. But when you're going to throw five hundred million dollars at the government and the settlement, you know they're fine with nobody going to jail. And that's what's going to happen here, even with EY. Somebody, listen, you you can't be so bad at your job. That you're not going to spend the 10 minutes that everybody has been screaming about for years. Like they're really pointing at the fraud, right? How many of us are just saying, here it is, pick up the phone and they don't, and they don't do it. So to me, that's complicit. Nobody's going to go to jail. They're going to pay a fine. They're going to be fine. Well, we'll, we'll see. I mean, the German um, regulatory bodies seem to be extremely embarrassed about this because well, they should be fired. Well, because the because of the ban and short sellers of Wirecard, they're looking incredibly stupid, right? And in, you know, in, incredibly and going after bad. the the FT. Yeah, I mean, it's just bizarre, isn't it? But I I think that there's there's some you know serious question marks being raised about um, EY, and there was a funny thing. Did you see that one of the partners has gone off to to join Deutsche Bank as their head of accounting? <laughs> Why wouldn't he? You know, it, it it reminds me, look, you know, you say there's serious questions about EY. Look, insert, you know, top four here. KPMG, Pricewaterhouse, Deloitte, whoever. You go back to the old Jim Chano saying, when, when people ask him about a company that he might be critical of, who's the auditor, he says the same thing every single time. Who cares? Who cares? Every great fraud is a great audit firm behind it. That, that's right. <laughs> and and that brings me to the question. I mean, look, I know this is drastic, and I'm just going to throw it out there because I've been hearing it. Would we be better off without audits? I mean, financial statements are prepared by management anyway, right? People think that the auditor prepares the audit. Uh, management prepares the audit. Auditors check it. Except in China, where <laughs> where I'm hearing auditors actually, you know, write the audit as well. So they're not really doing anything but checking the work and they're not checking it very well. Wouldn't we be better off having the market at risk and having people like you looking at audits? Well, I, 
I mean, I'm quite happy with the status quo. You know, the, the fact that the auditors are there, don't do a good job, or, or not all of them do a good job all of the time, means that there's quite a lot of risk for investors. So investors are, are keen to buy my forensic accounting course so they understand what to look for. Well, I mean, that's funny and self-interested. I mean, that's that's like when people tell me, you know, why did you go to Washington to hold China-based companies accountable? It's low-hanging fruit. You make a lot of money off of them. And, and the answer becomes, because my neighbors are getting ripped off. My family are getting ripped off. They're, all Americans are getting ripped off. And you can't catch them all. I understand you're making money on them, Stephen. I'm being, I, I'm joking, Dan. I mean, you know, of course, the auditors need to step up to play and do a proper job. I mean, that, that is absolutely the thing that they must do. And, I, you know, I've written a blog about this. It's yeah. been published in, in the UK financial press. Yeah, you've been very critical I'm, of them. You have been. You know, I'm really hassling them to, to try and buck up. I mean, I was on the phone to two of the very senior guys at one of the big four a um, couple of weeks ago. I'm on the phone tomorrow or a Zoom call or whatever tomorrow with um, the head of quality at another of the firms. And I'm really pushing them to try and improve and up their game because I think it's, it's shocking. And it's as you said, you're not even trying to sell them something. You're just trying to help. I've been really pushing the regulator here. Yeah. And the problem is, you know, I'm just Steve Clapham and who, who am I and why should I listen to you? I've also been trying to speak to the, the, the people that drop the accounting standards. But, you know, I, I went along to a deathly um, lecture by one of the accounting standards board people in the UK and, and one of the people from Pricewaterhouse. And, after, you know, afterwards I went up and they, they were talking about the new standards that they're looking at. And I said, you know, could we just have a conversation about let's, let's not try and do any more new shit. Let's just try and sort out the crap we've got. Good advice. They, they just don't get it. You no. know, I'm working just now on um, the new lease standard. So IFRS 16, I've forgotten what the number is in the United States, but we, it's a similar thing where you bring operating lease assets on balance sheet. Mm -hmm. It's nonsensical. The people that draw up these accounting standards, they ought to be taken out and shot. Well, that's probably a bit too severe, but... <laughs> They, you know, they should be taken out and put in stocks in the courtyard of St. Paul's Cathedral, and everybody could go up and throw rotten tomatoes at them because they are making a complete mess of it. And the everything that they do in terms of new accounting standards is designed to make the things more complicated, much easier to obfuscate, and completely incomprehensible to the lay person in the street. And what I'm trying to do is say, you know what? We can't buy bonds anymore. So everybody's got to buy equities. So everybody needs to be trained and equipped in order to understand That's what right. are the good companies and what are the bad companies. So That's they should right. be able to understand the bloody accounts. Otherwise, why bother publishing anything? That you're you're hundred percent right. And it's past not buying bonds anymore. You can't put your money in the bank anymore. Like you could put your money in the bank 15, 20 years ago and get two or three percent interest. Now it costs you money to have your money in the bank. So they're pushing everybody to the stock market. To own real estate, it's so expensive between taxes and whatever other things they throw at you locally and federally, you have to be pretty smart to own the real estate. So they're pushing you to the stock market. And you're exactly right. If you're going to push everybody to one place to put their money, they should actually know what they're doing. And you make things so complicated. like. You know, th these gain on investments, right? Like you're pushing that to the balance sheet. You have to revalue them every so often and then put that gain on the balance sheet. It's crazy. It's crazy. Why wouldn't you just make a note, right? And just say, okay, here it is. But like, it, and these things are like third tier valuations at times. So they're not even, they're not even first tier valuations. Well, they're, they're quite amusing um, checking all the step up valuation gains and the Chinese companies. It's a, it's a, I think that those sorts of provisions are just b bizarre. And, you know, Matt, who works with me, is a real technical accounting expert, used to be the education director for the Accounting Standards Board. And, you know, I have these conversations with him about, you know, why, why did he do this? And 
you know, he, I mean, he gives the economic case for it, but the, the way the standards have been designed is incredibly theoretical. So, yeah, you, you know, you've got a perfect theoretical answer, but it gives you the wrong result in practice. And I'm like, well, screw the theory. Let's have something that gives us something that we can use. And, you know, we're j just like so far apart. The, the, and, you know, what, what will happen is that people will lose the faith in the accounting statements. And then they'll go back and say, well, what are we going to do now? I've already lost the faith, right? I don't know where you stand, but like, I don't, I, I don't know what faith you could have in them. You check them diligently yourself, uh, so I guess you don't really have faith in them. I think where we are is, yeah, the 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 mom and pop investor who can't invest in the bank anymore and or put their money in the bank anymore are are going to lose faith too, and they should. They should lose faith in in sell side analysts. And let me make the point that I'm not saying sell side analysts are dumb. <laughs> they are. That's that's the craziest part about it. They are far from dumb. There's some very, very smart people on that side, just not putting out the whole truth. And that's what drives me crazy. And auditors, very, very smart people who have no interest in finding fraud. They'll flat out tell you that's not their job is to find fraud. And then corporate governance, which, you know, people don't understand that to be an independent board of director, what is your job? It is to work on behalf of the shareholder not management, but so often they're working on behalf of themselves and management rather than the shareholder. Uh, there's no such thing as corporate governance here in the United States. I mean, it's, it's like a nice little part-time job that you, or you're on a conference call every three months and you get $50,000 a year and, and $5 million in stock options. We have the saying in, in the UK, it's like the old boys club, you know, so it's the, you sit on my board, I'll sit on your board. I had, I had, kind of a vague impression that America would be better. And I've got this great chart. I'm doing a, a presentation on how do you evaluate management. I found this great chart. It's got the non-executive directors of the top S&P 100 and who sits on whose board. And it's like a, a spider's web. Right. It, it, I mean, it's astonishing. It is astonishing. And I, I you know, I go back to... Um, just a side story, um, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, uh, Congresswoman, and uh, there's not a lot I agree with her on um, socially uh, or fiscally, but she had Jamie Dimon in her sights at a congressional hearing, and she was laying into him pretty good. And I was, you know, I was like, you go, get him, get him, get him. And she said, she talked about how much more money he makes than the average employee at that company. And it's an obscene amount of money, right? It's thousands of times more than, and, and of course you and I both know he's not that much smarter than the average human being. Well, he probably is. No, he's not. No, he is not. Not, not thousands of times smarter than the average human being. Thousands. No. Okay. No, sure. uh, and he doesn't work thousands of times many hours uh, than, than these people. It's just unjustified. And she had him. And he just kind of smiled at her and said, you know, uh, you could be right, but uh, I don't set my salary. That's the board of directors. They set the salary and, you know, I, I don't really have much to do with it. That's, that's their decision. And it stumped her. And I just really wished out of the 30 other, you know, Congress people that were there, somebody would have next up would have been, that's right. You're right. It is the board of directors. And tell me, Jamie, how many of them are your buddies? And how many boards are you on for them? And are they really, truly independent board of directors? And are they really working on behalf of the investor if they're paying you 2,000 times what the average worker gets there? But we digress. Sorry, I went off on that little tangent. But I think, I think that corporate governance, if we fix that first, a lot of other dominoes will fall. Well, I think the you know, the change to make um, stock um, bonuses tax deductible has led to, you know, massive inflation in, in U.S. corporate salaries and, and bonus packages. And it, it kind of creates the wrong incentives. Oh, undoubtedly. You know, if you've got a, an earnings per share incentive, 
and you're going to collect 10, 20, 30, 50 million dollars, guess what you're going to do? You're going to make the numbers up. Not and even you, that. You know, it's all within your levers are within your own control as to how much you earn. And that seems to me a rather stupid system. Well, it's not even, I mean, they do it in broad daylight, Stephen. It's not even making the numbers up. Now you take a, a, I mean, a blue chip company even that doesn't need the money, but they'll borrow $2 billion, put the company more in debt and use a billion of it to buy back stock. What happens to the stock price? It goes up and then they cash in their, their uh, options and they make hundreds of millions of dollars doing this putting the company in debt where it doesn't need to be to drive up the stock price and to cash out their options. Nobody does a goddamn thing about it. It happens every day. And there you go. And that's not even, that's not even a counting gimmick. That's not even a trick. That's in broad daylight. Yeah. Well, it's, um, I haven't looked at the data for a while, but I remember looking at the data and the corporate buyer was the largest buyer of equities. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. Well, look, I would say, you know, you are a, a fascinating individual. You've seen it from all angles that, that, that I uh, can suss out here. You're on the sell side, you're on the buy side, you work for the hedge fund world, you work for the banking world. Now you're doing your own thing on the forensic accounting side. Your courses look very interesting. And I would say like, you know, I get the idea of having an MBA and having a degree and taking these college courses, but, you know, speaking at some of these colleges and speaking to the students and unfortunately speaking to the professors, your courses seem much more real life. There is theory and then there is what's actually going to happen to you and your bank account. And it seems like what you're teaching really flows through to the bottom line of an individual versus the theory that you're getting in school. Not that you shouldn't, but I think your course is worthwhile. You guys should consider it. Thanks for those, those kind words. I think, you know, the experience of the students is the thing that's important to me. And what I've found is that people just like the idea that they'll get practical tuition. So they can buy a course, you know, our average course is like 400 pounds or so $500. You know, it's not, we're not giving them away. But if you think about you buy a course like that at the start of your career, and if, it, if you learn from it, that knowledge will compound over your life and will be a fantastic investment. And um, we did this um, Analyst Academy 12-month program where we've got, funnily enough, a, a mix of people that have sold their businesses, so people who are quite late on in their career, They've sold their business and they want to take control of their own destiny. So they don't want to just hand the money over to a financial advisor and pay them 1%. They would say, well, actually, you know, I know about business and I can learn how to invest. And I've got graduate trainees who are looking to get into asset management. And it's been very rewarding for me to see how these people actually respond and see them, um, you know, growing and, and, and learning. And I've got... Um, some very, I'm, I've been very critical of the CFA program because, in my mind, um, you know, the CFA should equip you to be a really good analyst at the end of it. It's a huge amount of work. It's incredibly expensive, mm -hmm. and the the kids that are going through it are, are are really trying very hard. And you know, I've had um, I've had to, to to give tuition to people that have 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 emerged from the CFA. And they, you know, you show them a balance sheet and a cash flow statement, and they barely know which end is which. And they're a CFA. And they're a CFA. Yeah. And you know, I kind of get that it's a sort of universally recognized accreditation, but it's just not good enough. And what I'm hoping is that more of my institutional clients that I I do the forensic accounting courses with will actually begin to see the people that are coming through my analyst academy and will say, you know what, these guys have got A, they're keen and they've spent their own money, they've invested their own money in their own education and their development and they've got through this course. So, you know, just by going through this course, they'll know a hell of a lot more than they would otherwise. So we can, we can 
allow them a lot more latitude. We don't need to give them as much help as we otherwise would. And they'll see it as being a, you know, a, a useful qualification. It's obviously not a recognized qualification, but there's no reason why an unrecognized qualification couldn't be as good as a, one that's so widely recognized. And what we're hoping to do next year is going to work with a couple of universities in London where we're going to get some people on the program and we're going to get some institutions to look at their stock pitch at the end. So the idea will be you will get a group of 10 or 15 students, they'll go through the program, and at the end, they'll write up a research report and they'll do a stock pitch to some institutional investors. And so the institutional investors will be able to see the quality of the people. I think some of the guys are really, really good. And they'll they'll have the opportunity to to put their foot in the door. That that's the plan, Dan. I don't know whether I don't know how easy it's going to be to bring off. No, I I, I think that I think that's doable. Sure. No, no, no. I think I mean seeking alpha does it. You can do it. <laughs> I think we you know. But Dan, I'm going to get you. You're going to be on my panel then. Well, I mean that would be fine. Uh, I you know I I'd love to do it, but. Uh, I'm going to be tough. <laughs> hey, hey, that's what we want. We want tough. Okay. Uh, I, I would say that, unfortunately, uh, the, the thing that's going to be maybe a tipping point for you is to get one of these universities to really, really be humble for a moment, look at their program, look at your program, and give you an accreditation. Uh, I think that's going to, unfortunately, that's going to matter. Um, and this is a good way to get there when, when, when you have these 15 students come out there and it'd be great to see their presentation versus 15 of Columbia's. That would be cool. Um, yeah, we'll see. That would be fun. Yeah. yeah. So look, I, I mean, I think you're, you're a great guest. I'd love to have you back on the show, maybe talking in 15 or 20 or half hour segments about really hyper specific things that you're interested in or part of your course that people could dig into for a short amount of time and understand it, just give you a different platform. It's about your book, right? Smart Money. So if people really want to look at that, they can see it in a holistic way, looking at the Smart Money Method, your book, or we could do a few segments that uh, give a chapter or so in there. Sure. Well, listen, it's been really good fun. I really enjoyed talking to you. And um, yeah, I would love to come back. So we'll see you in the new year, hopefully. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. It's been fun. Okay. Thank you, Steve. And thanks for listening. This is our interview with Steve Clapham. I enjoyed it very much. I hope you did. If you did, throw us a like, throw us a retweet, give us a comment. Let us know who you want us to interview next. We want to hear from you. Thanks for joining the pack. We'll be back with you.